Okay, that should be happening now. So let me just double check. Yep, it is. It's, so we're recording now. And then also, if you want to ask a question during the presentation, probably the easiest way to do it is just type it into the chat box. And then uh, I'll try to monitor that as any questions come in as we go along. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. First of all, we bought a house in Bernie about two years ago. Um, and uh, it, it looked real pretty when the pictures were taken by the real estate agent, uh, as you can see. Uh, in the backyard, there's all kinds of weird plants that should be growing somewhere else but here, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the front yard was mostly uh, grass with a, uh, virtually every plant being uh, non-native from the non-native magnolia to some kind of olive tree to a bunch of other non-native plants, and, and including iris. We did save some of the iris because uh, uh, Terry likes the iris, so <laughs> I couldn't get rid of all of it. Um, we had Nandina growing down the side of the house and just, just all kinds of non-native stuff. Um, and so the thing that we decided to do was to undertake a, a goal of uh, turning it into something completely different. Uh, all of the trees in our yard are pecan trees. So in the summertime, they're shaded. There's a lot of shade, so I have to deal with that. So a lot of what we're doing is experimental in terms of what we're putting in the yard to see. A lot of these plants that we're putting in, of course, like sun or partial sun. So we're kind of seeing how they do, and then we'll move them around the best we can. Uh, trim up a few of the, the pecan trees a little bit as we can as well to kind of provide the little spots of shade. The nice thing about the pecan trees is they're not a solid dense um, shade throughout the day. So like a like a stand of, of big oak trees would be. So sun kind of filters through the entire yard at different times of the day. So, um, so that's what you see front yard, backyard. Um, we, uh, yeah, we had lots, of, we had ligustrum, I mean, we had it all. Um, some of it I've never seen before. And the idea was to get rid of it all. And as I mentioned, some people think this would be lovely backyard or front yard, but uh, I didn't see it that way. So again, so here's the, here's the front of the yard uh, before restoration began, uh, looking at the house from the street. We live on a dead end street, so that and with no, uh, what do you call those homeowner associations? We have no rules. so. Yeah, for, yay for us. Um, sorry if you do. This is what it looked like uh, in July, and uh, it was just starting to turn dry, so it's still pretty green. Um, I did enhance the green a little, as you can tell, because that's not mold growing up over the front of the house. Now that I'm looking at the picture, but one of the things we did, we have a lot of uh, deer, a lot of extra deer, and in, in, um, Bernie, so we put up a picket fence to kind of close it off, and we felt like. We've not had a deer in the yard since we put the pickup fence up. And the, the, my, my thought about that is that it's a small enough yard and a small enough space that I don't think the deer would be comfortable getting into that small space. Um, uh, so, so far, so good. We've, we've had no issues with the deer since we put the picket fence in the front yard. And the backyard was already fenced off, so we didn't have to worry about that. So you can see we've got um, obviously a lot of uh, plants on the left side of the yard kind of go through how we did these different beds and um, it's um, it's a little bit different looking now so we're real happy with how it's coming along Again, from the front door this is what it looked like uh, when you open the front door uh, now this is what the front door when you open the front door this is what it looks like um, you can see some of the plants are extremely tall we have a lot of uh, uh, annual sunflower uh, we've got a lot of calpin daisy we've got a, a patch of um, maximilian sunflower uh, some of it is really tall, and when you have really good soil like we do, we don't have rocky soil. We're across the street there is uh, down off over that uh, pavement is Cibolo Creek. So we're very fortunate that we have that there, and as a result of that, um, the only rocks we have in the yard are rocks that are, have been brought in. Um, so we can dig down uh, probably a foot before we hit, start hitting real hard clay soil. So it's really rich, uh, sandy loam, uh, pretty well drained. I mean, really well drained. Um, and in dry weather, we're learning that that may not necessarily always be a good thing. Um, we're the, the front, the, the the right half of the yard that you see there, looking in this direction. That was the first part of the yard that we tackled because it was mostly it had more sun available to it. We've been slowly working, kind of expanding and shrinking the uh, Saint Augustine grass around the perimeter of the rest of the yard. So that is all still a, a big work in progress. 
So again, as we started, we started with this front. Uh, we took these um, SOTALs, uh, which was the only native plant that I know of uh, in the yard, uh, at least native from Texas, and uh, moved them out to the front of the, the yard to get them away. And then that also created an addition, additional uh, barrier potentially for deer jumping over the fence. And then the rest of all this we got rid of. So this is the first part of the yard we did. Again, there it is right there. We've got um, in the spring when things were, were popping pretty good, um, there were days when I would have close to 25 species of, of native plants blooming in the front yard on any given day. Right now there's probably about eight or nine. So one of the, our, my objectives was to make sure that when spring started, we had flowers uh, from the get go and all the way, hopefully until uh, the, the last of the monarchs have, have migrated through. So that's the second year. And then up against the house, we created a little path out here. Um, I, you will see a hose right there. On occasion, we, have to, we do have to put a little water on things, especially after we've done some transplanting, but we try to minimize that. But we've also planted some things here. We put some native vines right here on a little trellis. And again, we're kind of experimenting. One of the things that we learned was liatris, the blazing star, does not like being up against the house because it's really a lot of shade, too much shade for it, so it gets leggy. So we're going to be taking that out and pushing it out towards the sun uh, this fall. Uh, but I just want to kind of show you how we did it. We also now have a path that goes through this middle section of the yard using uh, limestone rocks that were just having to be laying in the yard. So uh, we didn't have to purchase anything like that. All of my plants, virtually all of my plants, I have grown from seed in a little greenhouse that we have. I've done some plant rescues um, to, to establish other plants. Um, and uh, as you go along, one of the things you'll learn at, at this process, I remember, remember early on when I was learning about native, using native plants, people go, put your native plants in and you just walk away. Uh, of course, that's not true. We put, we put in two Maximilian sunflowers um, and I uh, probably got about 30 of them now in the first year or so. Uh, that's something that uh, keep in mind that things will spread when they're not in their natural setting uh, with all the competitors around. One of the things you can't really tell here yet, but one of the things we also did instead of just wildflowers, we also put in some of the native grasses to provide some structure and then hopefully some competition as time goes along um, as we as we move forward. Uh, the front the front of this yard right here again this was. Um, you have to imagine now the picket fence goes in front of these plants that are right here. And so we put in some, some small uh, native shrubs. We had some big old um, cedar stumps laying around for whatever reason. So we've now incorporated those into the gardens uh, and used uh, those to allow our native vines to grow up into those um, and, and have some place to go. So that's, again, a work in progress. Uh, we've planted um, Geez, hundreds and hundreds of seedlings. Some of them survive, some don't. Uh, we're waiting, you know, some of them may take two or three years to, to bloom. And uh, don't ask me about the, uh, the, uh, the rooster down there that uh, came with the marriage. Um, but I allowed it to persist. Uh, maybe that scares away the deer, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, right here, um, notice this, this tree right here we cut out it's a non-native uh, uh, magnolia of some kind. Um, and uh, what we've done um, is actually use that in the backyard. And we'll show you how we did that uh, here in a moment. So don't forget that that was there. And then a bunch of this stuff, we got all rid of all of that. We left, of course, those two great big rocks. Again, here's another one of those stumps that we're using to allow vines to grow up there. We did put a trellis in the corner here. Um, and uh, again, it's just a mix of native plants, both shrubs, woody plants, and vines, and um, uh, herbaceous plants. Again, here's the, that bed kind of wraps around. We have a dog, so we gotta give, we've got to give old Allie some of the yard. But my hope is over the course of the next two years is to get this crash replaced with something native, and, and we'll just have to see what that could possibly be because of the shade requirements there. And then in the front of the yard, we, um, again, we put in the sotals, took out all the iris, um, and uh, we put in lantana in here, which of course is pretty deer resistant. We've got mealy blue sage. We've got uh, woolly iron weed. In the springtime, this whole bed over here uh, is covered up with um, uh, uh, pink evening primrose. 
uh, and a lot of other things. But none of these things, I never see deer feed on any of this stuff right in here. We've got some Damianito, we even got the, we're able to, uh, we were given some lace cactus uh, from Cibolo Nature Center. Um, I don't know why we were, but they had about 50 plants and we took three or four and they've survived, even in this um, sandy loam soil. So I've been surprised. Um, cow daisy has gone nuts. Uh, you can ask Terry about that. So that's one of my favorite plants. So, uh, but the outside, you can see it's a pretty good boundary or border, keep away the deer, and then you got the fence, and then you've got more plants inside. So, so far again, so far so lucky. Um, we hope that that will stay that way. Here's the backyard before the restoration began. Uh, one of the things I should tell you, if you don't already know this, when you go to cut one of these trees out, um, they are full of cockroaches. I mean, all kinds of wood cockroaches. Um, it's about the only thing that lives in there. It's gross. And they're really hard to cut out, but we've been, also, we've been very successful getting rid of it. We had vinca growing back here. Um, the tools that I used to transition this yard were a fork, a digging fork, and a uh, hand trowel. And the digging fork, we just went out, we, we uh, created small squares, ripped the grass out of there, and then dug down and ripped out more of the roots as best we can. And we've been pretty successful at keeping the uh, St. Augustine at bay except along the edges, which you can expect uh, that might be the case. So again, here's the backyard. Here's what it looked like after we got rid of all the stuff Didn't look nearly as attractive, does it? Of course, this was winter time. Um, and, uh, but then we started moving in on it. This, we, there was, this water feature happened to already be there. We restored that, got that running again. And it has become a Mecca every year for um, hundreds, literally, of cedar wax wings on a daily basis. Uh, by the way, they're fruit eating birds. And so if you have uh, fruit eating birds eating fruits and pooping seeds, guess what you get a lot of seedlings. And uh, we, I, I know what they're eating. They're eating grapes. They're eating um, all that darn plant that has the dark berries and the evergreen leaves and lots of people have them planted and they're a weed and they're just an absolute weed. I can't remember the name of it. I have this, this uh, thing about not wanting to remember <laughs> that plant. And um, some dogwood, lots of hackberry uh, seedlings come up. So we spend a lot of time pulling uh, those things out. Um, but that's okay. That's part of gardening, right? Um, so we put this in a different location and we got this all fixed up and running. We got rid of all the vinca in here and started filling it in. This is what it looks like this summer. Um, we've got many species in here. We've got um, uh, a couple of woody plants as well as um, uh, some asters that are, that are shade lovers. So that's kind of nice. We've got some white uh, or some uh, Texas milkweed growing in here. It's on its third round of flowering um, and some other things. So, and then of course, some non-native stuff that uh, Terry likes hanging up on the pots and stuff. Notice I keep saying it's Terry's, those are Terry's plants, not mine. Because I, hey, I, except for spider plant, I have no idea what any of them are, but they look nice. So um, I'm not completely heartless when it comes to non-native stuff. Uh, we got this the little bed, we got rid of this. Um, and that you can see where this was, used to be. And uh, it looks like this now. So we've got some inland sea oats. And of course, we're going to have to watch for that because it does like to spread. We've already got babies. So if anybody needs any for a plant sale, I've got them. Um, also, I happen to have a lot of um, frost root too, if you're interested in uh, seedlings. Uh, but anyway, we put a lot of things in here columbine, everything from columbine to uh, some uh, 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 the grasses, like I mentioned. And some other things are doing okay, some th things aren't doing so well. Uh, but we've got pearl milkweed growing over on the vine. We've got a we've got um, uh, you've got a toothache tree that's growing up in here with the idea of it eventually it attracts. Um, oh, the dog does his duty wherever he does, and then we just try to avoid it. So it's a small dog. That's the good news. Uh, but we clean it up every once in a while. So uh, let's see here. Uh, nice Esperanza. Um, yeah. Um, well, we actually only have two Esperanzas. We just put those up. You have to do much weeding, of course. Uh, lots of things come in that we don't want, mainly those trees from the birds, uh, those seedlings from the birds. Um, but then, you know, keeping the grass, the uh, non-native grasses out. The biggest weed we have really is winter grass. And I, I, I you know, the first year I, I, I let it go for some because we didn't let it go to seed, but we let, left it in the yard because it provided ground cover. This year I'll probably be a little more aggressive getting it out before it gets too big. Um, uh, why didn't you move those big rocks in the front up the side in the front right up to the sidewalk? Oh yeah, I kept the rocks out on the road because A, I'm not that strong and we don't have any heavy equipment to move those rocks. Um, 
we have a neighbor that um, thought we were probably a lunatics and now she is all aboard. She's now using iNaturalist. She comes and does the Facebook lives that I do with the TNT program. She uh, uh, has learned that there are certain plants down in her creek bottom that are not to be sprayed. Um, and uh, just two weeks ago, she started recycling. So, you know, we're having an influence here. Uh, but uh, because we're on a dead end street, there's only a neighbor on either side and the creek is across the street. So nobody has a real reaction. Um, and uh, we've been very uh, pleased about that. So that we, we got lucky that way. Um, yeah, that's why we keep some grass, Lori, because uh, uh, the, the puppy likes to do that. Although the puppy is known to come right out in the garden and lay one down uh, as well. So there you go. And this greenhouse, by the way, is what we've been using to grow all of our plants. And you'll notice it's in transition. I didn't update my picture. It's done. I rebuilt the greenhouse and uh, it mostly came back together in one piece. But we did pretty good. Um, a few other things in the backyard. This is the backyard against the property line, the soap trees in the neighbor's yard. This is some kind of crazy vine that grows all over the place. We beat it back as best we can. Uh, and we're going to get more aggressive with it here um, soon. Um, but one of the things, remember that tree I told you, that magnolia tree in the front yard? We turned it into a bird feeding station and it's worked great. Now, yes, squirrels get on there occasionally, raccoons at night come up there. But uh, the birds love it. They've got lots of perches. Notice that we've actually got a hackberry tree growing up behind it that will eventually replace that as that rots away. And the birds, of course, go into those vines all the time. Um, so we put that up there, uh, which is really nice. And then uh, another thing we've done here is there's a fig tree right here. And I, I will say I have nothing against fig trees, but it's not native to here. And we're eventually not going to have it, but it's great cover for the birds right now. We put our bird feeders over there. But I've come in and put a evergreen sumac and three um, wafer ashes in there that eventually will grow up into some beautiful cover to kind of replace some of that fig tree that's right there. So, And that fig tree is actually on the other property, so I can only hack it back from my fence line here. Uh, we also took a little area that was already rocks and had nothing in it. We put it, I put frost weed in there, and there's a few other things mixed in there. Uh, and the frost weed blooms in the fall, looks fantastic. The birds use it as cover. Uh, we have a bird feeder hanging right above that. Um, works out really well. We actually have a witch hazel tree right here that we grew up with, that we were given. And it's doing really well, even though it, it does need, uh, um, probably tends to need a little bit more water. In the back, we created a privacy fence back here. Um, and uh, then we put in some plantings in this area here after we hacked back that vine. It's a constant battle with that vine. But we've got a variety of things here that look nice in the shade. We've even got uh, Susan Bogle. This is, if you're on, I think you are. This is the uh, a patch of the um, uh, Eastern gamma grass she gave us. So there it is. It's growing and it's doing very well. I hadn't flowered yet, but it will be. And then we also took extra rocks that were just laying around the property and we built a water feature. Um, and we get some birds that, that come in there. We bought, we went to a store and bought some uh, uh, one pot of, or one small pot of uh, scouring rush just to give it some greenery. And oh my gosh, does that do well in cold water in a pot? And then we rescued a couple of other plants that are aquatic and they're doing far too well. So we've had to trim those back a little bit. We've also, there's this old wellhead right here. Um, I wish it was oil, but it's not as water wellhead. Um, uh, but that said, we put in some fall white aster in here and it covers it up nicely and provides some, uh, some uh, cover. So we've done that. So today, um, these are just some of, I'm not gonna go through this whole list, but these are some of the plants that we now have in our yard. Uh, these are uh, all the native woody plants. I think we're close to 40 species now. Um, but usually onesies, I mean, just one of, or one or two. And we know that, uh, that my, my goal, we have these huge, tall um, uh, pecan trees, but we have no understory. We have no shrub layer, basically. So what's going to happen over time is we're going to create these different woody layers as well as the ground layer with the native plant, the native forbs so that birds will be able to visit the yard from, and have a place at whatever level they use to forage for insects and food. So that's what we are, um, uh, my intent is to be. So five years from now, hopefully it'll be a little bit more jungle-like. Um, we also have several vines that we've used. Um, and of course, then a lot of native plants, all, all told, I think I ended up uh, somewhere around 137 species that we've planted 
I'm not saying all of them have survived, but that's a year to year thing. Some come in, some leave, uh, but they're doing pretty well. And then several species of our native grasses in ones and twos as well to see how they do. Um, and they're all actually thriving. So I'm real happy with that. So, um, now what I wanna do, um, here's just to kind of give you, this is what we now have in the yard, uh, different times of the year. Um, and we're getting all kinds of different native bees, have no idea what most of them are, uh, but the, lots of diversity there. We're still missing a lot of diversity, I think, in insects because it, we were such, so part of a, just this massive, you know, neighborhood of, of mowed grass, even though the creek is behind us, that's been our godsend is that there's habitat across the street, so that's helped, but it's going to take time for us to see more, uh, more diversity of butterflies and bees and and things like that, but but things are coming along. Things are coming along. So again, I think there it is: 137 species of native plants supporting native bees. We've documented. Uh, we actually have an iNaturalist project for our yard, um, so I can document every time something begins to bloom. That's a native plant or any kind of insect or bird or whatever I can get a photograph of. We've had almost 40 species of butterflies show up in our yard. I haven't got a photograph of all of them yet, uh, but they're coming along and. Uh, uh, this was our first monarch. We've had monarchs fly through the yard over and over again. It's the first one I've seen land in the yard. And I got it was it there that day. This was spring. You can see this is an old old uh, monarch. Uh, but that's coming along. We're real happy with that. Nearly 80 species of birds we've seen in the yard or over the yard, um, and uh, several of them are everyday visitors. Uh, we put up a couple of nest boxes. You can see there that a titmouse nested in one. We've got, we, in the winter time, we get all kinds of uh, sparrows. Uh, we have resident uh, 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 Carolina wrens all over the place. We even have a, a nesting pair somewhere, probably down in the creek bottom, of red-eyed vireos. We have phoebes that nest in the yard. Uh, we had even a Canada warbler visit uh, for uh, one day. And then we have a, a nesting uh, 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 great crested flycatchers and summer tanagers. And right now we have birds in the bird baths drinking water nonstop throughout the day. Uh, and I just recently photographed the yellow-throated vireo. Um, They're all kinds of robins, uh, the great crested flycatchers, the summer tanagers, lesser goldfishes, all of those things are using water. So um, uh, water, is, especially when it's this dry, is really, really critical. Um, the figs, the fig trees don't, the fig tree doesn't seem to grow very many um, big figs. They're all really tiny. We also have, oh, the white butterfly, by the way, was the uh, uh, checkered white. Um, and checkered whites are about the size of a, a regular sulfur, a yellow sulfur butterfly. Um, ooh, a large monarch. Oh, okay, so what that white one might, there's two possibilities. Could be a white peacock, look that up. The second one would be um, a female of the large orange sulfur. So check that one out as well. They have, they're normally yellow, but the females can be white. So check those two out. You might have an idea. Uh, we have fig, I think we have fig beetles. I don't know what they do, but they're all around the yard. They're big um, and they seem to like the fig trees. So, but maybe they're feeding on the figs and that's why they don't get big. All right, so, the, so I'm gonna shift from the yard. So that's kind of what we've done. A, a few things, you know, it, it takes time. Um, and some things are going to work, some things are not going to work for whatever reason, the best we can do. And um, uh, yes, we have to weed. Uh, and I don't mind because I love having my hands in the soil. I would do that every day, all day long, if it wasn't 110 degrees in the summertime. Um, so that's part of it. But the nice thing about it is uh, we're starting to see diversity increase in the yard. And that was my goal from the get-go. And um, uh, and if that will continue to evolve. We'll continue to grow new plants. Some plants will die out. We'll add, we'll add them back in different places. And it's just kind of a revolving, um, evolving experiment, if you will. Uh, but the, the bottom line is I can go out and see all kinds of cool things in just my little cracker box, our little cracker box uh, yard uh, in Bernie. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. And by the way, we've had, um, uh, yellow crown night herons land in the trees. I'm not giving taking credit for that, but they've landed in our trees. We have a red tail, red shoulder hawk that nested across the street. The big cottonwood would come to our yard uh, to hunt. Um, we do have we have had a couple of cat issues, but we've trapped those cats and got those out of there. 
And uh, I would just, as somebody was talking about cats and the, the, the pet bee plant or whatever it was you were all talking about earlier, uh, cats should not be outdoors in a, in a plant, a setting where you're trying to attract wildlife. They are absolute destroyers of wildlife. And I would absolutely urge you to uh, keep your cats indoors. I mean, it's, it, they are devastating wildlife populations across the globe. Um, they are incredibly um, parasitic animal when it comes to nature. So that's my spiel on cats. And that's, I used to own a cat, so I don't hate cats, but they should be inside in terms of uh, how they interact with the natural world. So going now to some of the plants, I had to do a present, I did it, not had to, I got to do a presentation with the National Wildlife Federation featuring some of the native plants that uh, they asked me for my top three or top 10, I guess. And of course I can't come up with a top 10 list with native plants, there's too many. Um, so what I've done is put together, I put together this little presentation I wanted to share with you tonight that just kind of highlights some of the native plants that I've used and really focus on based on my experience out doing butterfly surveys um, and just being out in nature and observing what critters are using what plants for food. And right here is a perfect example. Here's a Texas thistle and hummingbirds nectaring on hummingbirds, by the way, will nectar on anything. Um, and so uh, it was kind of cool to see them nectaring on a, on a native thistle, Texas thistle plant. A few considerations. First of all, if you're going to do some restoration work in your yard, what do you have already? I remember visiting a couple of the yards of people that are on the presentation tonight and they had some great stuff. Um, and uh, so know what you have and then protect those things. Don't destroy that stuff uh, because there may be things that are really valuable uh, and you just need to learn what they are and, and how, how, how valuable they are. Um, natives, I'm always gonna advocate for native plants or native first and foremost to your eco, your, your eco zone, if you will but then also plants that are native to our state at least, because I've, I've broken, I've bent those rules a little bit. Um, and I've got a few plants um, like the one below on that picture there that that bee's flying into. That's a penstemon from, um, from the, uh, the uh, Houston area. So along the Gulf Coast, but it does really well here. So I, I've flexed a little bit on those, those rules. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, select plants. One of the things I, if you're trying to attract uh, bees and pollinators, try to select plants that either have lots of flowers, individual flowers like this Benzman does, or a head that has lots of flowers on them as well. The reason for that, it, it should ease the foraging of those insects. It might attract more insects. They can sit, for example, on a thistle head and just tap, you know, just drink from multiple, multiple flowers at the same time without having to burn up a lot of energy. Um, tubular fl flowers, depending on the length of the tube, can be good for bees and all kinds of things. Um, a, a short, you know, a, a, a bee with a short proboscis isn't going to take and feed on the same plant. So try to vary the lengths of those, um, and that way they can uh, they, you get more diversity of plants. You get more diversity, presumably, of, of insects. Um, and no, notice I said deep and shallow flowers again with the proboscis length. Um, Nectar season, nectar at different seasons, really, really important. Try to have, I've seen different recommendations anywhere from three to nine things blooming at one time. Um, and that's, those are great recommendations. The idea is to get them started early in the spring blooming and then get all the way through that, especially this heat of this transitional heat that we go through for a couple of months is really tough. Uh, but there are plants out there that you can use and I'll show you a couple of those. Um, and then also uh, just different size flowers to can, increased pollinator diversity um, in terms of size of bees. The, lots of our bees are very, very tiny uh, and, and we'll take advantage of that. Plants of different heights. So you notice I've got everything from, from frostweed and, and um, uh, uh, cowpen daisy and the sunflower all the way down to things that are ground huggers. And that way I'm accommodating insects and that need different things at different levels in the canopy, in the, that kind of sub canopy uh, underneath the trees. And then um, if you can get plants that are host plants for insects, for butterflies, that's all the better. Um, there are some out there, milkweed's the obvious one uh, for monarchs, uh, but there are lots of other plants that uh, other uh, butterflies will take advantage of. And then if you can avoid pesticides, we don't use pesticides in our yard. Uh, we use a digging trowel, uh, which is you know sometimes uh, a long, slow way to do it, but it works out for the most part. 
So what I'm going to start with are just some of the composites, the, the mist flowers and bone sets. These are, these are plants that when they are blooming, that, as some of you already know, are amazing at attracting butterflies, particularly the queens. There are two species that we have that you can do. The one that's really na native to our area is, is um, blue mist flower. It grows usually in wetter areas or, or in, in shaded areas. I've got some in my yard that's starting to bloom now and it's gonna, it's done, I grew up from seed and it is spectacular. It's, it's, I think it's gonna do even better than Greg's mist flower, which seems to like the sun more. Um, and, and you can kind of tell that because if you just look at the leaves, the leaves of, of Greg's blue mist are divided, they're kind of, you know, finger-like. The leaves of blue mist flower are solid. They're a little bit wider. Um, so that's for absorbing more light in a shaded situation. So think about that in terms of where you plant, uh, where you plant them, but they're both excellent. And once they start blooming, uh, they bloom throughout the rest of the growing season, especially in the, in the late summer and fall. So both of them wonderful, wonderful plants for attracting. The other um, bone set, if you will, that I, I just die for is, is uh, shrubby bone set. This is a bush that can get maybe six, eight feet tall if you let it go. Uh, but when it be begins blooming in the fall, it is prolific in uh, delivering flowers and butterflies and bees. When I worked at the Guadalupe River, we had two plants in front of the rust house and I would go there after work at night um, and I would spend from the time I got off work in the fall until dark photographing butterflies on those two plants. It was a nonstop craziness. So if you had to plant only one shrub, I would highly recommend planting the shrubby bone set. It really is a spectacular uh, flowering plant and, and it's certainly for attracting pollinators. And then um, if, if I tell people sometimes that if I could only choose one plant to grow to try to attract insects, it would be uh, mealy blue sage. Uh, it blooms multiple times throughout from spring all the way through fall. It attracts bees, it attracts butterflies, it attracts beetles, it attracts uh, nectaring flies, you name it, they come to it. It attracts hummingbirds. Uh, we have two species at least in the state, but two I wanted to highlight. Of course, mealy blue sage uh, grows all over the place. Giant blue sage is a little more, um, it's, it might actually, where y'all live, it might actually be easier to find, but you can find this, it's generally a little taller, the flower's a little bluer. Um, and usually I, where I find it mostly is, is a little, uh, where it's a little bit more moist. At least that's been my experience anyway. But uh, both of them, either one is fantastic for, uh, are fantastic for attracting um, uh, butterflies and insects. And of course there are the cone flowers. One of the things I've learned over the time I've been here in Texas is that purple cone flower is actually very limited in its range in Texas. Um, so it's not that common of a native plant. Um, Thunder, actual thunder, I just heard it. Um, that's wonderful, we might actually get some rain. Um, but it's such a great plant for butterflies and pollinators that why not plant it and it does really well here. Um, these I grew from seed and they have done really nicely. They flower for a long time. They, uh, again, attract a lot of insects. Um, mine are, I still have these blooming, they started blooming back in April. I still have some blooms uh, going on in here. It is the heat of August. The other uh, purple cone flower that I really, really like is pale purple cone flower, uh, Echinacea um, angustifolia. It gets a little taller. Notice that the petals are a little more reflexed down. They're paler, uh, but again, very, very, I've grown several of these from seed and they're now doing remarkably well and blooming. A lot, again, very attractive to butterflies and other pollinators. So. You can't go wrong with the uh, purple cone flowers for sure. Another one that blooms in the fall, and actually it's, I just saw the first wild one today blooming uh, here in Bernie is Stiff Blazing Star uh, or Liatris punctata, Gay Feather is another one, and another common name, it has lots of common names. It grows to, it can get, I can get to two and a half, almost three feet tall, but if it's been grazed by deer or mowed over, it's not gonna get as tall. This, is, this happened to be a plant that, um, it was growing in a very rocky situation. It was only about a foot and a half tall. But look how beautiful that that, that uh, cluster of uh, plant uh, stems is with all the flowers. Very attractive to lots of butterflies, including monarchs. Found throughout most of Texas, easy to buy. Uh, there are other species of liatris that I'm not highlighting here, 
uh, they grow in eastern Texas, grow east Texas, and grow up into the uh, throughout the, the tall grass prairie regions of, of the state. Um, fantastic fall blooming plant. Uh, you can't go wrong with it. And then, of course, there are different kinds of bee balms or monarda. The most common one we have around here that I see encounter the most anyway is horseman or lemon bee balm with a pale. This is a real deep purple flower. Some of them are much paler. A really good smell. I love the smell of it. The leaves, uh, lots of bees and, and things come to it. Not so much butterflies, but, but I have seen a lot of different kinds of bees feed on this, but a wonderful plant gets to be about three and a half, four feet tall. Um, and it can be found and very easy to grow from seed, by the way. I mean, when I say very easy, really easy to grow from seed. Uh, another one that we have in the area is called spotted bee balm. Uh, it, it, it seems to withstand hot weather a little bit more. I've seen it down in South, Texas, or South San Antonio, uh, but it's found very widely across the state. But you notice the flowers are yellow. Uh, and it's a really beautiful plant all by itself. I mean, just that instead of having the, the bold purplish pink um, bracts, it has that kind of creamy white, almost yellow bracts. I think it's a really attractive plant. Again, good for bees. And then for those of you that live where you guys live over closer to I-35, uh, in the tall grass prairie regions of our state, um, it grows wild bergamot. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but uh, where I grew up up north, it was a very common uh, tall grass prairie wildflower. Uh, but it's it's found um, along I-35 corridor up in the north Texas. Um, I have not encountered it yet. Uh, these were taken in uh, Missouri. Uh, but it gets about five feet tall or can. Uh, very fragrant, very beautiful flowers. Bees, butterflies all love this plant. This is something you may not have heard about but uh, before, but you might check it out. It's really a gorgeous uh, uh, native plant to Texas. It is pouring down rain, thank goodness. I hope it happens for about two hours. Um, and then of course, prairie verbena. Uh, all of you are guessing are familiar with prairie verbena. It's another one that is uh, it's persistent in terms of flowering. A lot of times when nothing else is flowering, this guy is. And just to kind of show you, it attracts a, a lot of butterflies of different kinds. It's low growing, so it provides some lower growth, kind of spreads out and grow into some nice clumps. And then another lavender or purple flower is basket flower. These are annuals, whereas the prairie, prairie verbena is a perennial. Basket flower generally blooms in the early summertime. Uh, you'll see it, it's a, it grows in disturbed sites very easily and can grow in large patches of it. Uh, one flowering head, uh, I had a, a uh, Terry's um, uh, nephew was here last summer, and uh, he, uh, uh, he's mildly autistic, so one of the things we did one day is went out and collected heads of these, and then we had a contest to see who could find the most seeds buried in one of these flower heads, and he won with 127 seeds in one flower head of basket flower. So it gives you an idea how many flowers are there, how much nectar that is. It's a beautiful flower, flowering plant, and big butterflies, particularly the big uh, swallowtails like you see there really seem to like this flower. It can get quite tall. Uh, it germinates very slowly in the greenhouse. I started germinating them. I put them in the greenhouse in November. They didn't start germinating until almost April, and I still have a few that are starting to keep uh, continuing to germinate. So uh, a very pesky. Uh, you got to be persistent with this plant. But again, really, really quite beautiful. And then, of course, Texas thistle. I know people, most people aren't going to want to go plant Texas thistle in their yard or their back 40, but if you have Texas thistle, protect it. Learn to recognize it from the non native musk thistle. Um, this is a gentler flower ahead. Notice the white stripes that go up each of the bracts. Um, it's a very, just not as big and bulky and nasty as, as uh, the, the non native thistles. Keep it around because it attracts. Um, a few butterflies and, and honey and bumblebees even love it, as you saw from the lead picture, um, hummingbirds nectar on it as well. So a wonderful plant that grows native in Texas and, and certainly around here and worthy of consideration in, in a native uh, planting. There are several species of foxglove that grow in our area. Our most common one is cobaya. Uh, foxglove, it gets fairly tall. The flowers can range from this deep very pale, almost white flowers. Um, but it, it is not so much for butterflies, but really good for bumblebees and other kinds of uh, pollinating native bees. 
Uh, another one that's even more beautiful is the scarlet penstemon. Uh, some people call it hill country penstemon. Uh, very, very pretty flower. I've grown both of these from seed in numbers and uh, they're doing really, really well. Uh, these are both perennials. So once you have them, you're gonna have them back. Uh, and it's, it's really kind of nice. Uh, the other one I wanted to share with you, and this is where I kind of went outside the box a little bit. Um, I got these, I believe, from Mrs. Dunnington. Um, let's see here. Let's see. See the basket flower. Oh, you know what? Okay, the white butterfly. Got that basket flower. You know, I've never seen birds eating the basket flower seeds. They're certainly big enough to uh, be eaten by birds, but that's a really good question. Um, and then penstemon. Um, I don't poison it. I certainly wouldn't eat penstemon. I think it does have. Uh, I think Dr. Dunnington is in the show. Joel, is you know if penstemons are toxic? <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm going to fall to the medical professional to answer that one um, that somebody's put up on the chat box. But I got this plant, this Gulf Coast Penstemon, from the Dunningtons. And by the way, it's doing remarkably well. I believe it's from Neil, uh, but they're doing really good. Either that, I got them from Susan Vogel from the. From, and, and either way, thank you, both of you, because they're remarkable in terms of producing flowers and the honeybees in particular and other bees in life. Uh, blooms March to May. I'm going to have lots of seed pods that are almost open and ripe. So if anybody needs seeds or seedlings, I'll be growing them. Um, returning to a few red flowers, we've got a couple that, of course, are really good for hummingbirds, uh, both uh, standing cypress and turk's cap. Turk's cap, of course, is a woody plant. Standing cypress is a biennial. Uh, they're both great to grow and uh, will be uh, wonderful for hummingbirds. And I should tell you some of the larger sulfurs. Oh my gosh, I want to go dance in the rain right now. I really do. But I will stay here and persist through this program. Um, tanning cypress is great for hummingbirds. It's also good for some of the large sulfur butterflies that are attracted to red flowers. So keep that in mind. Um, both of them grow in the area. Uh, you can grow, uh, you can start standing cypress from seed very easily. Uh, I've got a lot of first year plants right now that will be blooming next year. So keep that in mind. And then a couple more red flowers, the salvias, of course, cedar sage, and then tropical sage. Uh, cedar sage typically blooms, at least in my yard so far, has only bloomed in the spring, has not re uh, emerged even though the plants are still green. I'll be anxious to see if we get some uh, rain like this late this summer to see if it might re bloom in the fall. Uh, I've seen it do that in. Uh, natural setting, so we'll see if it does it in my yard. And then tropical sage is on its third bloom period right now, I think at least the third bloom period, but it adds some great color to the yard. Um, you can tell the difference on these because the, the leaves of, of uh, tropical sage are pointed at the tips, whereas the leaves, these are among the differences, but this is the primary difference. You notice this is more uh, kind of kidney bean shape and more round. The teeth are more round, they're larger, and it's kind of blunt on the end of the leaf. So that's one way to tell the two of them apart. And by the way, I'm growing a cedar sage with not one cedar tree in my yard, and they seem to be doing okay underneath one of my uh, uh, many, uh, one of, underneath one of our many uh, concrete. Uh, Joel Dunnington says, yes, testaments are points. I think it was in Dallas or something like that that did it. So um, don't, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Okay. Um, there's something else that shouldn't be eaten that's been pushed as a miracle cure for the, for the disease right now, too. So, stay away from it, too. Um, and then, of course, some beautiful flowers that everybody's familiar with um, Black Eyed Susan and Blanket Flower. Uh, easy to grow um, in, uh, from seed, uh, both of them. The nice thing about them, they'll drop seeds. And Black Eyed Susan, by the way, I uh, have to put some in. And this year, I did not have to transplant any. They grew up on their own. Uh, and they will continue to do that, I think. These um, are attractive to a lot of different kinds of insects. I never see a lot of butterflies on them. Flowers are really tiny. But as soon as I said that in a presentation, I had somebody send me a picture of a lovely butterfly on a lovely blanket flower. So they will attract butterflies, but they're really good for other pollinators as well. And of course, add a, just a wonderful splash of color for the time that they're blooming. And then a, a couple of tall ones that are two of my favorite. If I've said that these are my favorites before, well, these are two of them as well. So, uh, but these are both uh, in the same genus, frostweed, which of course will be blooming. Actually, I have one in my yard right now starting to bloom. 
but they'll bloom in the fall and usually their timing of bloom is, is uh, times out really well with the migration of the monarch butterfly. And one of the things that we think about when we talk about monarchs is that we talk about having milkweeds for them. Um, and certainly they need that when they come back through Texas in the spring to lay eggs on. But in the fall, as they're migrating, they're actually gaining weight. And most of that weight gain, according to research, is showing is going to take place in Texas as they're adding weight. They can't just put on a bunch of weight and then migrate like birds do. Darn, the sun's already coming back out. Um, but uh, we'll take what we can get, though. Uh, but this one is really good because it's prolific, lots of flowers, monarchs love it. And so they can add fat as they come through Texas to help them to survive the winter. And there's some research that shows that their ability to have flowers in the fall for the fall migration is going to be a, a potential indicator of how successful they are in the winter and then thus how successful they are getting back to Texas to lay eggs in the spring. The other one, of course, is cowpin daisy. Um, it can get, both of these can get out of hand, cowpin daisy especially. Um, the uh, lesser goldfinches do eat the, flower, the seeds of these guys though. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but if you like lesser goldfinches, what the heck. Um, but they will, in the spring, if you don't deadhead them and get rid of the heads, they will send up so many seedlings. I can just tell you from experience that it's unbelievable. And as much as I love that plant, I had to get used to pulling some seedlings because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything else. So I love it, but these are kind of plants that you kind of got to uh, have with some moderation, but both of them exceptional for attracting uh, monarch butterflies and other butterflies as well, as I'm sure many of you know. And another one that's good for attracting monarchs would be the Maximilian sunflower, which will start blooming here in another month or so. It can get to eight feet tall, nine feet tall, big flowers. By the way, if you squeeze the flower head, you'll, uh, the, the flower head, you'll actually smell chocolate uh, if you have a good sense of smell. And uh, Maximilian is a native plant. It does spread very quickly by rhizomes. So you have to keep that in mind. You may have to keep checking that if you're gonna have a small patch of it. And I say a small patch is probably all you need. Uh, it grows really well where there's moisture, but it grows along our, a lot of our roadside ditches as well. Um, and you can control this one, even though I'm not an advocate. Uh, the roadside uh, mowers will mow this down in the middle of the summer and it will bloom not nearly eight foot tall, but it still blooms prolifically. And again, it's a good one. Uh, there it is, thundering on the north side of Canyon Lake. Well, that means the rain's all moving south, so maybe it'll come through y'all. And then again, in the fall flowering uh, range of flowers, we have the goldenrods. Our most common one is prairie goldenrod, the tall goldenrod. Most people don't want to plant because it gets really rank and very tall, it grows along waterways and down in creek bottoms, places like that, um, along marshes. Uh, but are really both really excellent for attracting all kinds of butterflies, beetles, bees, um, wonderful, wonderful plants and, and look very beautiful in the yard. I've got the uh, prairie goldenrod in my yard and uh, typically around here it grows in really rocky soil. Like mine, it, again, doesn't have rocks. It's about two feet taller and it ought to be uh, doing exceedingly well. And then of course there are the milkweeds and I'll very quickly go through these because you guys have had enough programs on milkweeds. You should know all these by heart. But antelope horns around here is our most common species. You can grow them by seed. It is an effort, but it works. And, and I've, I've got right now about, uh, I don't know, 75 seedlings of uh, antelope horns right now. So they're doing, you know, hanging in there. Um, they, uh, the, the other one that looks a lot like antelope horns is green milkweed, but it requires wetter soil. You'll notice on the uh, antelope horns, the leaves typically are narrower and folded in half. The leaves on green milkweed are more egg-shaped and typically flatter. Uh, also, there's differences with the flowers. Uh, the flower petals on the green milkweed tend to be taller and stand up straighter, whereas the antelope horn are more out like this and, and a little bit more shallow. A couple of others that we have, the other common one we have in our area is Isotase milkweed, a good one for queens and some monarchs that will lay their eggs on it. The flowers aren't quite as attractive, but a very valuable plant for those species of butterflies. And I should tell you that milkweeds also are incredible for attracting pollinators of all kinds, including butterflies. Um, they're very fragrant. If you've never smelled the flowers, get down and get your nose in there and smell them, they're delicious. And again, 
I've seen individual flower heads of antelope horns with 15 to 20 hair streak butterflies on it, one at, at the same time. Uh, so they are very, very uh, beneficial for uh, lots of pollinators. Here's a milkweed you can grow in the shade. Mine is doing remarkably well at, at my house. Uh, Texas milkweed, a little hard to find, but um, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. We've actually, our iNationals project, we just got done curating these to see how they're doing, and they seem to be doing right well across the, the range here in Texas in the hill country. So that's another one that, again, a wood, a shade loving plant that you can uh, have a milkweed in your yard if, if, if you have nothing but shade. Two other milkweeds I wanted to share with you, and then, of course, there's lots of them. There are over 30 species in Texas. Um, but two that do grow in the area or can grow in the area, uh, the butterfly weed, uh, tuberosa. Notice this is bright orange. It does not get as tall as tropical milkweed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage tropical milkweed, frankly. Um, there's just too much, there are too many issues with it in terms of monarch health. Um, although the jury's still out, depending on who you talk to, uh, a little bit, but there's definite issues. But butterfly milkweed is prolific. It's beautiful orange flowers. This is the one of the milkweeds that does not have milky sap, uh, but but monarch butterflies love it. And a lot of other butterflies feed on the flowers of this uh, beautiful milkweed. And then the other one is swamp milkweed. This grows in wetter areas. Both of these are found in Texas, by the way. Um, swamp milkweed is found in Kerrville along the Guadalupe River and may be found in your area. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it grown along the lake, but if you have, let me know. Um, and yes, Susan Vogel, you can have as many Calpendini seeds as you would like. Um, I will start gathering them for you. Uh, uh, considering all your help with my garden, that's the least I can do. Um, so beautiful swamp milkweed. I mean, it'll grow five, six feet tall in a good, healthy setting. Lots of flowers. Butterflies go crazy for this plant. So if you want to consider that, um, try it. See what happens. Uh, it does need a little bit more moisture than some of the others. So keep that in mind as well. And then the last two I'm going to show you are things you might not even think about. And these are in the uh, genus Erangium. Uh, one of them is Rattlesnake Master. It is uh, a member of the uh, Parsley family. And it's a beautiful plant. It has, it, it gets Erangium yuccafolium. Its leaves are yucca-like. It's a beautiful plant. It attracts a lot of butterflies. It's not well known but it does grow in the tall grass uh, prairie regions of, of Texas. I've even seen it along I-10 between uh, Bernie and Comfort. So it does grow around here. It's a perennial, kind of a unique looking flower and a beautiful whitish cream colored flowers. The other one that's its cousin, the more of you may be familiar with, which is Zeringo. Um, this is a, a native prairie plant. Again, beautiful color. Um, I've had, I've planted it a couple of times. I've had trouble growing it. Uh, but if you get out in those rocky areas, um, it can be quite prolific. Very beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, and again, another great one for attracting butterflies. So, so uh, uh, that's something else I just wanted to share with you. I want to show you this video. I don't know how well this is going to play. I'm going to try something here. I want to see if I can. Um, Okay, I'm going to optimize the screen for a, a full screen video clip. So I'm going to click on this now. What I'm hoping that's going to do is um, allow this to play. The reason I want to share, some of you may have seen this in other presentations I've done before, but I wanted to share this with you because it shows that any wildflower out there is going to be valuable to pollinators. And this is a plant called marble seed or false gromwell. It grows all over bottomland forested areas. It's a big old spring bumble, bumblebee that just came out of its uh, uh, overwintering area. This has little creamy white flowers that hang down. Uh, the reason I want to show you is that this, the, uh, one of the things I want you to notice is watch when the pollen starts flying. Um, you'll see it here pretty quickly. But notice how it feeds upside down. The pistils stick outside the flower. There it goes. There it goes. Hopefully you saw that flash of, of little dust, that uh, magic powder, um, and you'll see more of it here. This plant is a wonderful plant. I've seen hummingbirds, monarchs, bumblebees, all of everything nectaring on this plant. And yet this is one of those plants that people might go, what the heck is this? I'm just going to cut it down or just ignore it. Really, there it goes. There goes more pollen. Really, really cool plant. has quite very hard seeds. Look at all the pollen dripping out of it. So there it goes, soaring off into the air. Oh my gosh, I'm just gonna let you watch. 
can't get enough good food. Look at the clouds of pollen that are floating. There it goes. So the reason I wanted to show you that, A, because these plants, that nature, you know, has got all this stuff out here for these insects. So we got to keep that in mind when we're talking about native plants. The other thing that I love about this is just the fact that that flower hangs upside down. Its petals are locked together like this. The pistil sticks out like a tube. Okay, so imagine that. So the bee comes up, feeds upside down, has to push its head through that, oh, that to open that flower. The, the stamens are around mid flower stuck on the sides. So it hits that pollen as its head goes in. The nectar's at the, at the base of the flower, gets a drink. Pollen is now falling out onto the belly of the bee. So it's gonna spread pollen that way because remember those pistils are sticking out of the flower. So the bee comes up to the next flower, boom, hits it. Some pollen gets on the next flower. So again, what a great way to pollinate. And you also notice that pollen's floating through the air. So that means those pistils are sitting out there in the air. If nothing ever touches that, it may be possible that a pollen grain pushed around by a bee is gonna hit that and pollinate that flower. So it just shows you, I, I just think it's marvelous the way the natural world has arranged all of these flowers to, to do what they do. And, and I just, I had to share that with you. So if you have land and it's in a bottomland area and you have marble seed, keep it and enjoy it. I'm telling you, in the springtime when very little else is blooming, and this is blooming, you will have all kinds of activity from pollinators uh, of every stripe uh, enjoying it. So anyway, there you go. Uh, my email address is right here. We're recording this presentation, so you'll be able to get that from Deb. Uh, I'm sure if you have any questions or anything like that, uh, don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll be happy to help you. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, false. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Uh, what's your uh, opinion of pincushion daisy? I love pincushion daisy. Um, pincushion daisy, by the way, is related to um, firewheel or uh, a blanket flower. It is in the same genus, but normally it doesn't have any ray flowers, so it's just this little head of purplish flowers. And the bee, the, the butterflies absolutely go crazy for it. it. Smells super good. Blooms in the rockiest of conditions often overlooked because it has a basal rosette. Why am I talking to that screen when you're up there? Uh, it has a basal rosette that, that sticks to the ground and then sends up a long stem that can be, I don't know, two feet tall. And when it's growing prolifically, the bees and butterflies love it. So again, that's, I'm telling you, there are so many good choices. I couldn't cover them all. We'd be here all night. Uh, but anyway, I hope that that gives you an idea of some plants to look forward to having in your yard. Uh, the ideas for my yard may not fit your model or your what your definition of beauty is, um, but I'm a bit of a wild child and I want a bit of a wild yard. So uh, I say bring it on and I'll deal with it as, as uh, things come in and, and uh, who knows what's gonna happen over the next few years, but we're just getting started and I couldn't be more excited about the opportunity to be able to do this and, and share this stuff with you. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free ask. Otherwise, um, I'm going to stop sharing now and turn this back over to, I guess I should stop recording right now too. So let me do that first. Let me go up here. I'm going to stop the recording. Right there.